The 2023 Maui Invitational Field is absolutely loaded. But is it the best MTE field ever? You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, welcome into Locked On College Basketball, the only daily national college hoop show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shea. Joining me today is our guy, Leaf Tulin. Always great to have you on, my friend. We want to thank you so much for making Locked On College Basketball your first listen or watch every single day. Coming up on the show today, we are talking about this Maui Invitational Field for 2023. We already knew who the teams were. But earlier this week, the bracket was revealed, and we, friends, are in for a treat. I love MTE season. It's like I'm getting my turkey. I'm watching uh, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. I'm ignoring the dog show because woof, pun completely intended there. But most of all, I look forward to all the great multi-team events going on that week. So, Leaf, let's just get right into this thing. Let me give us the field And uh, then let's just start. We're going to talk about the matchups, who we think will win, MVP, all that kind of stuff later on. But we got several neat talking points today. And I want to start with what I said in the cold open. Is this the best MTE field ever? So let's just start with Chaminade because obviously they're they're the, the, the weight bringing this thing down. And for those unaware, Chaminade is not an every year participant anymore. They're in every other year, but they are in this year. And then the rest of the field, I'll give it to you alphabetically, Gonzaga, Kansas, Marquette, Purdue, Syracuse, Tennessee, and UCLA. So Leaf, even before we knew what the matchups and the bracket were going to look like, This field is just chock-a-block full. You know you're going to get great basketball. And I can't remember who it was, but I did see someone say that they believe this is the best MTE multi-team event field we've ever had in college basketball. That's a big statement. And my gut reaction was to say that that's simply because of Chaminade's inclusion that that just wouldn't be true. Um, Because even in the other years where Chaminade's not part of it, it might be a stronger field. But here's my question. Is the star power that we have amongst the other seven schools strong enough to make this the best MTE field ever? Leaf, what do you think? I hesitate to say the strongest ever, just because like you can think of a lot of different MTEs where the winner has won the national championship and the and this runner up is is a final four caliber team. And, and so I, I kind of see it that way where, where the, the, the powers at the top, I think this one might have the most depth. Mm. Um, for instance, we'll get to the bracket later. You, you'll have a battle of teams that were just two seeds playing each other in the first round of an MTE. Um, <laughs> so I mean, so basically that, to pretty, put that, to put that in reference yeah. for everyone, that's, that's literally a final four matchup, two, two seeds facing off in the first round. That's what we're talking about here. And, and yeah, and who knows if they're going to be as good as they they were this past year. And and neither team made it made deep runs, but in, they were two of the teams that were rated as the top eight teams in college basketball last year. One of them returns the Big East Player of the Year, and that's Marquette with Tyler Kolek. Um, so so I I think that's possible. I hesitate to say it confidently, just because I, I would say like Chaminade. It's funny because years past they were in it every year, like you mentioned. So. I think that that argument kind of nullifies itself for for Maui, but I've seen some battle for Atlantises that were unbelievable. True. I think some of the more recent MTEs that were smaller, they didn't have as many teams. Um, like for instance, last year it was Virginia, Baylor, Illinois, oh and UCLA. God. That was an awesome one. Um, so I think there are arguments for other ones, but this one certainly has an argument. It's it's thrilling as a college basketball fanatic who who like yourself, <laughs> I couldn't care less about the football going on. I, as soon as Thanksgiving dinner ended this past year, I was watching Michigan State and and, uh, and Alabama, and I was talking to my friend about Brandon Miller is going to be the top college guy picked, and then sure enough, that happened, and my friend was like, oh, I don't know, he's playing he's playing Sparty, and then Brandon Miller was awesome. So I, I love this stuff. I'm I'm really excited for it, and and I think the fact that the fields are really good and we don't know the bracket yet for some of the other fields, but like you, you can see the teams. I'm really excited. Yeah. And, and speaking of Thanksgiving week, I mean, this is, this is the, like, 
some people would call this the appetizer to Thanksgiving. I'm going to call Thanksgiving the dessert to the main course that is Maui because this is Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of Thanksgiving week. So it's going to be absolutely awesome. And I mean, Leaf, when I look at it, just just thinking about the, these arguments for is this the best field ever? I, I love all those points you made about are we talking top heavy? Like uh, a lot of times we talk about, let's think about major conferences. When we talk about the ACC, it's like the the full depth isn't there because there's some weight at the bottom, but it is pretty top heavy typically with teams like Duke and North Carolina and Virginia and recently Miami, for example, versus like a conference like the Big 12. I know it's different now with with the extra teams in, but where it's just chock a block full from top to bottom, maybe you have one team that's not great. And it feels like this field is more like a, a, a Big 12 has been the past couple of years, if I can compare it to that. Um, but but when I look at it, I mean, we've essentially got two of the top two or three teams in the nation in terms of probably what they will be in the top preseason top 25, thinking about Kansas and Purdue. We've got three of the top, I don't know, what would you say, like six or seven when you add Marquette into that? Where, where would you put Marquette right now? Uh, I, yeah, I'd say pretty confidently top 10. I, yeah. I'd have to like really hammer down the right. way I think I, we haven't about... done all that work yet this offset right exactly but like four of the top 15 when you think about Tennessee add in Gonzaga and UCLA you probably got six of the top 30 or 35 schools in the country this year and absolutely loaded so Leaf that is the next thing I want us to tackle I think this is going to be a super fun exercise I want us to take this eight team field and power rank it from one to eight, or maybe it's easiest to go from eight to one because of Chaminade. Uh, I, I've prepared a list. I'm curious what your thoughts are on power ranking this field. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to think about how it's easier to do one, one to eight or eight to one. So yeah. I, I think eight to one's easier. Okay. I'd go, I'd go Chaminade and Syracuse eight and seven. Yep. Th those like, it's so wild. But it's so easy to call Syracuse number seven. Isn't that nuts? Yeah, and, and then then you have to. I think the question beca becomes for me, and this this may sound a bit bit cheesy, but the question is basically: Are you ranking them for what they're at the start, or what you can imagine yes. them being at yes. the finish? Because I think there's teams like UCLA lost Jaime Hawkes, Tiger Campbell, Jalen Clark, and, and all these guys. They got a Dembona. They got some young European talent. Um, and Jan Vida and a couple other players. Right. But what does that team really look like? Yep. And and that's what I'm trying to think about. Yep. So, so I'd say I power rank, when I did my rankings, I did it for what they will be at Maui, not okay. long term. Um, so that would probably lead me to pit UCLA at six. Yeah. What? Yeah. Right? Like, I agree. That's where I have them. But that is to me to put UCLA sixth in the power rankings of an MTE. I can't yeah. wrap my head around that. Not to mention, like we met, I said at the out, out start, that they were a two seed last year. Yeah. And so it's not like it's like a rebuilding UCLA whatsoever. Yeah, that speaks more to what the strength of the field than to UCLA's ability. All right. So then that's that's six for me. At the start of this, th this next season, I'd put Gonzaga at five. They lost a core part of their identity in Drew Timmy. And Julian Strother. Um, and honestly, I can see a world where Gonzaga is six and UCLA is five. Um, but the, then I would put, I kind of like Tennessee's roster. I know. Um, I think early in the season, they'll be better than people would, would think. I think they may fizzle out a little bit just because they're physical. Their their defense will travel, so mm -hmm. to speak, where like mm -hmm. they don't have as much improvement to make early in that, that regard. So I'm torn between I'm torn between Marquette and Tennessee at four, because I can see Marquette being a more holistic and well-rounded team than even Purdue or Tennessee, but I think they need to, you know, get their team there. Like, uh, like I know they return most of their pieces, but they play a more finesse-oriented game, and that's not. And sometimes these teams that win these are either excellent offensively or they're rugged, and some of these teams are rugged, and that's Tennessee. So I will say. Ooh, this is tough. I'll put, <laughs> I'll put, uh, I'll put Marquette at four. Jeez. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm rethinking everything. Here, I got a question for you. In okay. This one. 
Kansas has an identity identity shift. Yep. Do you think they're going to be that good at the start? That's that was the only. I'll just go ahead and tell you, I put Kansas, but that 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 was my thought process of trying to do this. Is if I'm talking about where these teams are at right out of the gate, I still have Kansas one, but that is the question that gave me pause because it's like you got to work in Nick Timberlake, you got to work in Hunter Dickinson. But where I came back around and still put them at one is because of Dewan Harris running the show, because of Hunter Dickinson having been there essentially all off season and having the chance to work in. He's been around college basketball for a while. He knows what he's doing. And then similar to what you said about Tennessee, when you have McCuller and Adams returning um, kind of in the roles that they can play and the defensive things that they can do, I feel comfortable enough with it to go with them. The one thing I, I don't like about them, though, is K.J. Adams was playing the center last year. Yeah. And so now he's got to play the four. Um, but so I, without further ado, I'll, I'll rank uh, I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll rank them. But but I, I, I will definitely baffle. I'll, I'll go back and forth a couple a couple times later. Um, I, I'd go Marquette four. I'll go Tennessee three. I'll go Kansas two and I'll go Purdue one. Ooh. And it, and it's because their system is so well intact. They lose Brandon Newman, who at times was coming off the bench last year. They have the player of the year in Zach Eady. And the guards, which we often said, oh, they're not going to be good enough to win. They're older. And quite frankly, they're plenty good for mo- most of the regular season last right. year. They, we, they, we just saw we, – we picked on inexperience in That's the right. moments that it arised as opposed to – like what they were for the majority of the season. So I'd put Purdue at one. Okay. Do I hear Leaf Tulane being a little a little more bullish on Purdue this year than he was last year? Uh, probably not. <laughs> I, I'm just saying at the start. Like if you were to ask me to rank at the end of the year, this is a very different list. So that's, I, I why, that's why I was clarifying. Yeah. All right. So let me I, – I have very few differences from you. I have Chaminade at eight, Syracuse at seven, and it's like – a chasm from the top six to Syracuse and another chasm from Syracuse down to Chaminade. Um, UCLA six, Gonzaga five. And just those two things are boggling my mind to have Gonzaga fifth on this list, Tennessee four. Um, and, and that is somewhat based on, I'm really curious to see where Zakai Ziegler's recovery from injury is at with his ACL by that point early in the season. I've got Marquette at three, similar to why you said about Purdue, just essentially returning everything. I know they got to replace Omax, but uh, feeling still good about it. And then I have Purdue two and Kansas one. So we've got a similar top four with a few switcheroos there. Man, it it is going to be electric, and I absolutely cannot wait. Now, because of how loaded this field is, I'm wondering if we're going to see the national champion come out of it or if we will have a national champion that is outside this field. We're going to have that debate, the Maui field versus the rest of the NCAA field for the 24 national championship. We'll talk about that in just a second. But first, this episode of Locked on College Basketball is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you got to check out LinkedIn Jobs, which helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. It's easy to create a job post, and then you just add the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. And then you can use simple tools like screening questions to help make you filter out the candidates and get the right ones with the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you want to interview and then ultimately hire. Well, let's be honest, the right team member can have a positive and measurable impact on your business. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free right now at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Again, that's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, Isaac Shade, Leaf Tulane here with you today on Locked on College Basketball. We're talking about the 2023 Maui Field. 
Uh, we've known the field for a while. We got the bracket revealed earlier this week. We're going to look at that bracket here in just a bit. But before we get to the conversation that goes a little something like this. If I gave you the eight teams of the Maui field versus the rest of Division I college basketball, are you taking the Maui field or are you taking the rest of the field to win the 2024 national championship? I'm going the rest, and I'm not doing it numerically just because there's so many more teams. I, I can poke holes in all of these teams. And, and I, I probably could do that if I were skeptical enough. But I would say, for instance, Purdue, they have the same issue we discussed last year. They may have to adapt because now it's been intensified by losing to a, uh, by losing to a 16 as a 1. Right. Uh, as for Kansas, I think what made them so dangerous this past year and the year before, but obviously the year before they had Ochak Baj and Christian Brown, who are now established pros, um, and David McCormick for that matter, is now they're going to have to change their identity a lot of what made them very good at playing small ball, rip and go. They had a lot of versatility. It's now Dewan Harris is the point guard, and he was, but he's the point guard. And now KJ Adams is playing the four, and they're playing like high low traditional Bill Self ball that worked for like when they were playing Missouri, and that was their rival. Now now they've kind of established their their uh you know positionless basketball and i think it's going to be a little bit harder for them uh as for marquette i love tyler Kolak, but that type of archetype of player doesn't typically win as your as your star and their supporting cast got worse with omax being gone Oso does come back i like that team a lot ucla and gonzaga aren't what they were tennessee doesn't score easily enough so <laughs> There, there's the six. Uh, there's the reasons. Now, could a Final Four team come out of this? Could they win? Absolutely. Heck, um, multiple amazing... Final Fours could come out of this. Honestly. Yeah, and, and I'm and I'm I'm saying I know I rattled this off as if like oh there's no way. I'm not saying there's no way. I, I got to sit down and I Isaac and I've talked about this before off the air. I, I love to just look at look at rosters and think and imagine how they'll play, and then I'll watch like a week of basketball and I'll like I'll kind of say hey, these are my teams that I look out for. Last year I got lucky and I tweeted out the two teams that played out in the national championship. <laughs> right, I don't expect that to happen. But, but what, I really if did, both those what if it did? What if you pulled that off again? Well, then I need to be better at betting because I'm terrible <laughs> at it. Um, I try for too much, too many long shots. Um, but my, my point being is I think there are teams with fewer like noticeable holes on paper than these teams have. Do you have any of those on the top of your head right now? Or are you just saying that in general, you believe there are? Uh, I would say in general, I could I could make an argument for a few like the Blue Bloods. Uh, I think there's some teams that that you know I I believe in as well. So let's just start with the defending champs, UConn. Uh, likely not going to win again. It's very difficult to do that. Uh, so they have Donovan Klingon. I think Donovan Klingon's every bit as good as Dickinson. He's probably not quite as good as Edie. Um, so then they they're going to play through him. They lose three key players, so I don't think they're like at what they are, but I think talent-wise and belief and the mentality they're going to play is going to be good. Um, Duke, I don't like Duke, but I will say this. Uh, Tyrese Proctor, I think, is the best point guard in the nation. Hand up and, with you. I am. And then, so that, he is that's really good. Filipowski was a 17-point 17, 17 guy, as a, and he's back, and now you add five-star freshman. Okay, not a bad recipe. I, I, think, I think Duke's uh, underrated and Kentucky's got a ton of talent. So I, I don't have like the ones off the top of my head, but those are, those are just three that I can rattle off. And I think a fewer holes than these yeah. guys have apparent, but that said, I'm ranking them for the beginning of the year as it were, as opposed to like those ones I'm ranking to the end of the year. Yeah, man, just you talking about UConn and then previously Marquette there. I am so excited for the big East this year. I, I don't know if I can continue to express that heavily enough, but it's going to be awesome to see. Um, yeah, Leaf, I, you know, obviously the numbers dictate when we've got more than 350 teams in Division One that it would not make sense to bet on this group of eight, especially when one of them is Chaminade and you've also got Syracuse. But I mean, the fact the fact that we could even look at a group of eight teams and have a legit speculative conversation about the reality of, you know, these eight versus the field, I think continues to just show how absolutely ridiculously strong this field is. Um, if you did, let me ask it this way and we can each uh, name this and then we'll move on to talking about the bracket here in a second. If we did each take one team 
to cut down the nets on the last Monday of the college basketball season out of this field, who would you take? Kansas. Yeah, me too. I mean, I, I, I don't want to make that harder than it is. Uh, if I had to take another team just to be different from you, um, I, I would have to say Purdue. I, I don't see that happening, but I think that is a greater reality than either like Marquette, Tennessee, Gonzaga, or UCLA, unless, man, but that's the thing in the transfer portal era is teams just find combinations and find players that pop in ways you never expect. So um, I'd have to go with Purdue second if I'm not picking Kansas. But even then, it's like, man, if things work out just the right way for Gonzaga, wouldn't it be wild if this was suddenly the year when they actually win the national championship or something like that? So That would be wild. That would be wild. I don't see it but I don't not see it either. So we do want to uh, talk a little bit about the bracket, who we think will win these games, who will be the champion. Leaf and I will each give you our MVP and maybe a couple other things. I've also got next year's Maui field for you. We'll talk about that in just a second. All right, we're talking Maui Invitational here on Locked On College Basketball today. Let me quickly unveil the bracket for us. I know you've probably seen it, but just in case you haven't. Game one, right out of the gate, Tennessee versus Syracuse on ESPN 2, 2.30 Eastern time. By the way, all these games, these first four are all on Monday, November 20th. Game two, Purdue versus Gonzaga. That's also on ESPN 2 at 5 Eastern. Uh, the nightcap for those of us in on the mainland is Kansas versus Chaminade on ESPNU. That tips off at 9 Eastern. Boy, I got to take a nap in between these games, Leaf. And then game four, wrapping it up, UCLA versus Marquette on ESPN to 1130 Eastern time. Oh, boy, I'm tired just thinking about that. Leaf, who do you have in each of these four games? Well, I think the first one, Tennessee. Uh, is the better team between them and Kansas. I'm oh, sorry, and them and Syracuse. Sorry, I was thinking about the Kansas. How I had a point in my head. Anyway, Tennessee is better than Syracuse. Syracuse presents the the trouble that they could get streaky. They have guards that are talented, but Tennessee defensively is, is just suffocating. So I'm going to put my faith in Tennessee. Uh, game two, I'll take Purdue over Gonzaga because Gonzaga has got the capacity to run. Uh, which is the which is a big way of beating, you know, Zach Eady led Purdue, but I don't know if they've got the offensive sheer quality anymore that they that they've had in years past. And yep. you need to score against Purdue because it's not like you're going to have the game plans perfectly ready like like some of these teams did by the end of the year against Purdue. Like Purdue is a juggernaut; they beat the brakes <laughs> off of Duke and and Gonzaga last year, and I think they're going to be pretty hungry after losing to a 16. Oh, yeah, 100. percent So I got Purdue in that one. Game three, Kansas over Chaminade. I think that one's simple. Eight on my point for Kansas <laughs> is the round later. Uh, and then the, the, this is the best game. The, the nightcap's the best game. I'm going to take Marquette because I think that the lack of a true point guard losing Tiger Campbell is going to hurt them in this game. I think defensively UCLA is going to be a bear. Like I think Mick Cronin is going to make this ugly and Marquette's going to have to score in alternative ways. But Kolek has a way of doing it. Um, I think the fact that he's a veteran, he knows how to do it. Uh, they've got scores like Joplin's going to step in for the role that that Omax played. I think that Ross and some of these other guys know how to score. And then Oso can be a secondary facilitator. And with the pressure that um, UCLA is likely going to play defensively, and uh, I think the fact that he can relieve pressure is going to be really big. Yeah. And yeah. here, here's a bold take. I think Oso is going to get a Dem Bona in foul trouble. Ooh. And that's going to break open the game. Yep. I could very much see that being the case. That's a great call, Leaf. Um, I've got the exact same four winners of you of these first four games. I do, like you said, I'm really curious to see Syracuse's backcourt of J.J. Starling and Judah Mintz. I think that could be a lot of fun to watch this year. But as you said, man, that Tennessee defense is something different and uh, could uh, certainly, I'm sure Rick Barnes will have a plan for that. To that end, I wish we got a we could get a Tennessee UCLA matchup to see is against each other. That game might be thirty to twenty nine or something like that. Um, I'm actually going to go with Purdue Gonzaga for the for the best game of the first round. Um, but uh, UCLA Marquette, man, I'm staying up for that as well. 
on the next day, November 21st, Tuesday, based on what we just said, we will have Tennessee versus Purdue and then Kansas versus Marquette in the semifinals. Boy, howdy. I'm excited about that, Leaf. Who do you have in those two games? So that's where it kind of gets difficult because my brain thinks about it like who's the better team down the road, but I got to like recalibrate my brain. So (laughs) I'm going to take Tennessee to beat Purdue. They're uniquely equipped to defend Zach Eady. Like they have a lot of bigs. They're going to be physical. They're going to defend. I have a hard time seeing some of these guards withstanding the pressure put on them by Tennessee's relentless tech. It does suck that Zakai Ziegler likely isn't ready to play because, because I think he would be a game changer. Like if he were playing against, you know, Judah Mintz and JJ Starling, I I would feel very confident in that take. Syracuse is the type of team that could get hot if their guards are playing really well and they have the guard caliber to get hot. That's right. Um, So now Tennessee, the pressure that they would put on Braden Smith, Fletcher lawyer, and then it just makes the extra players on Purdue really need to shoot well because they're going to double the post. And Edie's not going to have as big a game, likely. Um, that makes me think Tennessee's going to win. That said, Purdue's main weakness to me is defensively. And Tennessee is prone to not making you pay for being not great <laughs> defensively. But I think they've got a really veteran team that that will be good in this, this environment, I think. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Josiah Jordan James is back, right? That's correct. Absolutely. Okay, so... Uh, this is a guy, I think this is his sixth or seventh year. And and then their backcourt, Vescovy, is going to knock down shots. Uh, when Zakai Ziegler, if Zakai Ziegler comes back, this is a team I, I think is going to be underrated yep. throughout yep. the year. And I, I would consider them as, as a real dark horse. Yep. And, and then I think on oh, Northern, watch, watch out for Northern Colorado transfer Dalton Connect from yep. Tennessee as well. That when I think he's going to be one of the key pieces that helps them overcome last year's offensive woes. And I think the other other big thing that, that you have to realize about Tennessee is a lot of what Purdue is able to do is because they put so much pressure on the rim. Like it was Gillis last year. It's going to be first and, and Kaufman ran this year. Is They're going to be able to supplement the potential put by, put on Edie with rebounding. Um, Tobe Owaka is a rebounding monster for Tennessee. Jonas Adu rebounds a ton. They did yeah. lose Olivier Kamwa. That's right. But, but it's I just think that they have too many bodies that will be less impacted than just about anyone when playing Zach Eady. So I like Tennessee. Yeah. And as for the next game, this is, this is a weird game because I kind of like Marquette in terms of the matchup, but Kansas plays Chaminade Marquette plays UCLA. Yeah. And I think the fact that Kansas plays such a, a inferior team in comparison, Chaminade's fine. They really are. But, but UCLA is the, uh, the other opponent. I think it's more likely Kansas wins, uh, both two games than it is almost that Marquette wins their first game yep. against UCLA. Yep. Um, so I, I like their chances in that matchup. Um, I think Dickinson against Igadaro is probably going to favor Dickinson. He's too big. And, and I think that Dewan Harris is going to pester Tyler Kolek. Yeah, I, I agree. What's funny is I have both of those exact two same winners. Tennessee over Purdue was obviously the tougher one for me. Um Saw a, an update from Rick Barnes recently that that Zakai Ziegler is progressing well, but there's still not a clear timeline for return. Uh, apparently, he's been doing well and itching to get back, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's just a, a big question of if and when he'll be healthy, and so we'll have to keep our eyes on that for sure. Um, but then Leaf, we have it sounds like the exact same championship game. This is hilarious. Tennessee versus Kansas. Who you taking? We got to be a little bit quick because we still got to get our MVP and uh, move along to next year's field as well. Uh, I Later in the season, I'd take Kansas. Right now, I'll take Tennessee. Okay. Okay. Wow. I'm going to go with Kansas. I, um, for kind of those same reasons that I said earlier, I, you know, I, I know you said the, some of those changes and I agree with it. I think, um, Dickinson will be able to do some work against a do and, and really curious to see. Um, I think so much, as you've said, hinges on where Zakai Ziegler's at. And if, if they don't have like 
his pestering to be able to stop Dewan Harris. I just don't see them being able to take him down. So I'm going to go with the Jayhawks, which means for me, I've got to pick an MVP from Bill Self's team. And I'm going with the big man from coming, transferring over from Michigan. Give me Hunter Dickinson as my MVP. What about you? I'll go with Santiago Vescovi. Ooh, uh, yeah. I kind of, I, I kind of like the most valuable player being um, Tobey Owaka, just because I think he's going to be a double double machine. But I just don't know if he scores enough. So I think if Tennessee, in fact, does win, uh, I think it's likely to be Vescovi or Josiah Jordan James who yep. lead them. So I'll go with Vescovi because yep. he's a better shooter. Um, so and also, I, I tend to favor veteran teams early in the season because while they're top end may stagnate a bit they'll get to it sooner um and so i think even in kansas's case they have more moving pieces so that's why i like tennessee and i guess i'll just go with the most uh heavily accoladed player right here and so i'll go with santiago vescovi but tobe owako as rostin says get get, buy your stock now (laughs) that's right uh and a thing that could go against what i've just said is bill self is like his bench usage is one of the four lowest in the country last year. And so in a three day, you know, boom, boom, boom thing like this, that, that could be a strike against the Jayhawks. Whereas I expect to see more guys off the bench for Rick Barnes. So um, that could be a feather in your cap. And I'm sitting here eating crow uh, for Thanksgiving dinner on Thursday. We'll have to circle back around to that leaf. By the way, obviously there's going to be breakout players. We'll talk about a first team. Andy and I will do another uh, look at Maui as we get towards Thanksgiving week. So we'll do go a little bit more in depth on it there. But for those of you who are curious, 2024's Maui field, I'll give it to you alphabetically. Remember, no Chaminade next year. It'll be Auburn, Colorado, Yukon, Dayton, Iowa State, Memphis, Michigan State, and North Carolina. So another good, maybe not quite as good field, uh, but it is another really, really good Maui field in 2024. Great stuff. Love these conversations. Always awesome to have Leaf to lean on. Uh, trying to look at this and figure it all out. Regardless who comes away from it, they're going to have to do some work to get there. And I cannot wait to sit down and watch it. I'm sure you folks can't either. That's it for today's episode of Locked on Tar Heels, Locked on College Basketball. Excuse me. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we want to uh, look forward to seeing you on tomorrow's show. I'll be talking a little Big 12 action along with some proposed federal legislation for NIL. We'll be checking that out. You can follow us on Twitter. The show is at Locked on CBB. Leaf is just simply at Leaf Tulane, and I'm simply at Isaac Shade. The joy of having weird names like both of us do. As always, apologies to the lawyer family. Let's go Wildcats, and until tomorrow, peace.